Indira Priyadarshini Gandhi Hindustani, Endur A Ndi I Listen, Ne Nehru, November 19, 1917 to October 31, 1984, was an Indian politician, stateswoman and a central figure of the Indian National Congress. She was the first and, to date, the only female Prime Minister of India. Indira Gandhi was the daughter of Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India. Despite her surname Gandhi, she is not related to the family of Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi is a common surname in Gujarat. She served as Prime Minister from January 1966 to March 1977 and again from January 1980 until her assassination in October 1984, making her the second longest serving Indian Prime Minister after her father. Gandhi served as her father's personal assistant and hostess during his tenure as Prime Minister between 1947 and 1964. She was elected president of the Indian National Congress in 1959. Upon her father's death in 1964 she was appointed as a member of the Rajya Sabha upper house and became a member of Lal Bahadur Shastri's cabinet as Minister of Information and Broadcasting. In the Congress Party's parliamentary leadership election held in early 1966, upon the death of Shastri, she defeated her rival Mirarji Desai, to become leader, and thus succeeded Shastri as Prime Minister of India. As Prime Minister, Gandhi was known for her political intransigency and unprecedented centralization of power. She went to war with Pakistan in support of the independence movement and War of Independence in East Pakistan, which resulted in an Indian victory and the creation of Bangladesh, as well as increasing India's influence to the point where it became the regional hegemon of South Asia. Citing vociferous tendencies and in response to a call for revolution, Gandhi instituted a state of emergency from 1975 to 1977 where basic civil liberties were suspended and the press was censored. Widespread atrocities were carried out during the emergency. In 1980, she returned to power after free and fair elections. After Operation Blue Star, she was assassinated by her own bodyguards and Sikh nationalists on 31 October 1984. The assassins, Beant Singh and Sutwant Singh, were both shot by other security guards. Sutwant Singh recovered from his injuries and was executed after being convicted of murder. In 1999, Indira Gandhi was named, Woman of the Millennium, in an online poll organized by the BBC. <laughs> Early life and career Indira Gandhi was born as Indira Nehru in a Kashmiri Pandit family on 19 November 1917 in Allahabad. Her father, Jawaharlal Nehru, was a leading figure in India's political struggle for independence from British rule, and became the first Prime Minister of the Dominion and later Republic of India. She was the only child a younger brother was born, but died young, and grew up with her mother, Kamala Nehru, at the Anand Bhavan, a large family estate in Allahabad. She had a lonely and unhappy childhood. Her father was often away, directing political activities or incarcerated, while her mother was frequently bed-ridden with illness, and later suffered an early death from tuberculosis. She had limited contact with her father, mostly through letters. Indira was mostly taught at home by tutors, and intermittently attended school until matriculation in 1934. She was a student at the Modern School in Delhi, St. Cecilia's and St. Mary's Christian Convent Schools in Allahabad, the International School of Geneva, the École Nouvelle in Bex, and the Pupils' Own School in Pune and Bombay, which is affiliated to University of Mumbai. She and her mother Kamala Nehru moved to Baylor Math headquarters of Ramakrishna Mission where Swami Ranganathananda was her guardian later she went on to study at the Visva Bharati University in Santiniketan. It was during her interview that Rabindranath Tagore named her Priyadarshini, and she came to be known as Indira Priyadarshini Nehru. A year later, however, she had to leave university to attend to her ailing mother in Europe. While there, it was decided that Indira would continue her education at the University of Oxford. After her mother died, she briefly attended the badminton school before enrolling at Somerville College in 1937 to study history. Indira had to take the entrance examination twice, having failed at her first attempt with a poor performance in Latin. At Oxford, she did well in history, political science and economics, but her grades in Latin—a compulsory subject—remained poor. She did, however, have an active part within the student life of the university, such as the Oxford Majlis Asian Society. 
On 26 September 1981, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, was conferred with the honorary degree of doctor at the Lukala graduation at the University of the South Pacific in Fiji. During her time in Europe, Indira was plagued with ill health and was constantly attended to by doctors. She had to make repeated trips to Switzerland to recover, disrupting her studies. She was being treated there in 1940, when the German armies rapidly conquered Europe. Gandhi tried to return to England through Portugal but was left stranded for nearly two months. She managed to enter England in early 1941, and from there returned to India without completing her studies at Oxford. The university later awarded her an honorary degree. In 2010, Oxford further honoured her by selecting her as one of the ten Oxasians, illustrious Asian graduates from the University of Oxford. During her stay in Great Britain, Indira frequently met her future husband Feroz Gandhi no relation to Mahatma Gandhi, whom she knew from Allahabad, and who was studying at the London School of Economics. The marriage took place in Allahabad according to Adi Dharm rituals though Feroz belonged to a Zoroastrian Parsi family of Gujarat. The couple had two sons, Rajiv Gandhi born 1944 and Sanjay Gandhi born 1946. In the 1950s, Indira, now Mrs. Indira Gandhi after her marriage, served her father unofficially as a personal assistant during his tenure as the first Prime Minister of India. Towards the end of the 1950s, Indira Gandhi served as the President of the Congress. In that capacity, she was instrumental in getting the communist-led Kerala state government dismissed in 1959. That government had the distinction of being India's first ever elected communist government. After her father's death in 1964 she was appointed as a member of the Rajya Sabha upper house and served in Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri's cabinet as Minister of Information and Broadcasting. In January 1966, after Shastri's death, the Congress Legislative Party elected Indira Gandhi over Murarji Desai as their leader. Congress Party veteran K. Kamaraj was instrumental in achieving Indira's victory. Because she was a woman, other political leaders in India saw Gandhi as weak and hoped to use her as a puppet once elected. Congress President Kamaraj orchestrated Mrs. Gandhi's selection as Prime Minister because he perceived her to be weak enough that he and the other regional party bosses could control her, and yet strong enough to beat Desai her political opponent in a party election because of the high regard for her father. A woman would be an ideal tool for the syndicate. First term as Prime Minister between 1966 and 1977 The first eleven years of Indira's position as Prime Minister saw her evolving from the perception of Congress party leaders as their puppet to a strong leader with the iron resolve to split the party for her policy positions or to go to war with Pakistan to liberate Bangladesh. At the end of this term in 1977, she was such a dominating figure in Indian politics that a Congress party president had coined the phrase India is Indira and Indira is India. <laughs> First year Indira formed her government with Murarji Desai as Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister. At the beginning of her first term as Prime Minister, Indira was widely criticized by the media and the opposition as a Gungi Gudia, Hindi word for a dumb doll or puppet of the Congress party bosses who had got her elected and tried to constrain her. Topic 1967 to 1971. The first electoral test for Indira was the 1967 general elections for the Lok Sabha and state assemblies. The Congress party won a reduced majority for the Lok Sabha in these elections owing to widespread disenchantment over rising prices of commodities, unemployment, economic stagnation and a food crisis. Indira Gandhi had started on a rocky note after agreeing to a devaluation of the rupee, which created much hardship for Indian businesses and consumers, and the import of wheat from the United States fell through due to political disputes. The party also for the first time lost power or lost majority in a number of states across the country. Following the 1967 elections, Indira Gandhi gradually started moving towards socialist policies. In 1969, she fell out with senior Congress party leaders on a number of issues. 
Chief among them was the decision by Indira to support V. V. Jiri, the independent candidate rather than the official Congress Party candidate Neelam Sanjeeva Reddy for the vacant position of President of India. The other was the announcement by the Prime Minister of Bank Nationalisation without consulting the Finance Minister, Mirarji Desai. These steps culminated in party president S. Nijalingappa expelling her from the party for indiscipline. Gandhi, in turn floated her own faction of the Congress party and managed to retain most of the Congress MPs on her side with only 65 on the side of Congress o faction. The Indira faction, called Congress R, lost its majority in the parliament but remained in power with the support of regional parties such as DMK. The policies of the Congress under Indira Gandhi, prior to the 1971 elections, also included proposals for the abolition of privy purse to former rulers of the princely states and the 1969 nationalisation of the 14 largest banks in India. Topic. 1971–1977 Garibi Hatao eradicate poverty was the theme for Gandhi's 1971 political bid. On the other hand, the combined opposition alliance had a two-word manifesto of Indira Hatao, remove Indira. The Garibi Hatao slogan and the proposed anti-poverty programs that came with it were designed to give Gandhi an independent national support, based on rural and urban poor. This would allow her to bypass the dominant rural castes both in and of state and local governments, likewise the urban commercial class. And, for their part, the previously voiceless poor would at last gain both political worth and political weight. The programs created through Garibi Hatao, though carried out locally, were funded and developed by the central government in New Delhi. The program was supervised and staffed by the Indian National Congress Party. These programs also provided the central political leadership with new and vast patronage resources to be disbursed throughout the country. The biggest achievement of Indira Gandhi after the 1971 election came in December 1971 with India's decisive victory over Pakistan in the Liberation War, that led to the formation of independent Bangladesh. She was hailed as Goddess Durga by opposition leader Adil Bihari Vajpayee at that time. In the elections held for state assemblies across India in March 1972, the Congress R swept to power in most states riding on the post-war Indira wave. Despite the victory against Pakistan, the Congress government faced numerous problems during this term. Some of these were due to high inflation which was in turn caused by wartime expenses, drought in some parts of the country and more importantly, the 1973 oil crisis. The opposition to Gandhi in 1973-75 period, after the Indira wave had receded, was strongest in the states of Bihar and Gujarat. In Bihar, Jayaprakash Narayan, the veteran leader came out of retirement to lead the protest movement there. Topic. Verdict on electoral malpractice On 12 June 1975, the Allahabad High Court declared Indira Gandhi's election to the Lok Sabha in 1971 void on grounds of electoral malpractice. In an election petition filed by her 1971 opponent, Raj Narain who later on defeated her in 1977 parliamentary election from Raybareli, alleged several major as well as minor instances of using government resources for campaigning. The court ordered her stripped of her parliamentary seat and banned from running for any office for six years. According to constitution, the Prime Minister must be a member of either the Lok Sabha the lower house in the Parliament of India or a member of the Rajya Sabha the upper house. Thus, this decision effectively removed her from office. Gandhi had asked one of her colleagues in government, Mr. Ashoki Kumar Sen to defend her in court. But Gandhi rejected calls to resign and announced plans to appeal to the Supreme Court. The verdict was delivered by Mr. Justice Jagmohanlal Sinha at Allahabad High Court. It came almost four years after the case was brought by Raj Narain, the Premier's defeated opponent in the 1971 parliamentary election. Gandhi, who gave evidence in her defense during the trial, was found guilty of dishonest election practices, excessive election expenditure, and of using government machinery and officials for party purposes. The judge, however, rejected more serious charges of bribery against her. Gandhi insisted that the conviction did not undermine her position, despite having been unseated from the lower house of parliament, Lok Sabha, by order of the High Court. She said, 
There is a lot of talk about our government not being clean, but from our experience the situation was very much worse when opposition parties were forming governments." And she dismissed criticism of the way her Congress party raised election campaign money, saying all parties used the same methods. The Prime Minister retained the support of her party, which issued a statement backing her. After news of the verdict spread, hundreds of supporters demonstrated outside her house, pledging their loyalty. Indian High Commissioner B. K. Nehru said Gandhi's conviction would not harm her political career. Mrs. Gandhi has still today overwhelming support in the country. He said, I believe the Prime Minister of India will continue in office until the electorate of India decides otherwise. <laughs> State of emergency 1975 Gandhi moved to restore order by ordering the arrest of most of the opposition participating in the unrest. Her cabinet and government then recommended that President Fakhruddin Ali Ahmed declare a state of emergency because of the disorder and lawlessness following the Allahabad High Court decision. Accordingly, Ahmed declared a state of emergency caused by internal disorder, based on the provisions of Article 352 of the Constitution, on 25 June 1975. Topic. Rule by decree Within a few months, President's rule was imposed on the two opposition party ruled states of Gujarat and Tamil Nadu thereby bringing the entire country under direct central rule or by governments led by the ruling Congress party. Police were granted powers to impose curfews and indefinitely detain citizens and all publications were subjected to substantial censorship by the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. Finally, the impending Legislative Assembly elections were indefinitely postponed, with all opposition-controlled state governments being removed by virtue of the constitutional provision allowing for a dismissal of a state government on recommendation of the state's governor. Indira Gandhi used the emergency provisions to change conflicting party members. Unlike her father Jawaharlal Nehru, who preferred to deal with strong chief ministers in control of their legislative parties and state party organizations, Mrs. Gandhi set out to remove every Congress chief minister who had an independent base and to replace each of them with ministers personally loyal to her. Even so, stability could not be maintained in the states. President Ahmed issued ordinances that did not require debate in the parliament, allowing Gandhi to rule by decree. Rise of Sanjay The emergency saw the entry of Gandhi's younger son, Sanjay Gandhi, into Indian politics. Sanjay wielded tremendous power during the emergency without holding any government office. According to Mark Tully, his inexperience did not stop him from using the draconian powers his mother, Indira Gandhi, had taken to terrorize the administration, setting up what was in effect a police state. It was said that during the emergency he virtually ran India along with his friends, especially Bansi Lal. It was also quipped that Sanjay Gandhi had total control over his mother and that the government was run by the PMH Prime Minister House rather than the PMO Prime Minister Office. Topic: 1977 election and opposition years. In 1977, after extending the state of emergency twice, Indira Gandhi called elections to give the electorate a chance to vindicate her rule. Gandhi may have grossly misjudged her popularity by reading what the heavily censored press wrote about her. In any case, she was opposed by the Janata Alliance of Opposition Parties. The alliance was made up of Bharatiya Jana Sangh, Congress o, the Socialist Parties, and Sharan Singh's Bharatiya Kranti Dal representing northern peasant and farmers. Janata Alliance, with J. Prakash Narayan as its spiritual guide, claimed the elections were the last chance for India to choose between democracy and dictatorship. The Congress party split during the election campaign of 1977. Veteran Indira supporters like Jagjivan Ram, Hemvati Nandan Bahaguna, and Nandini Satpathy were compelled to part ways and form a new political entity, CFD, Congress for Democracy, primarily due to intra-party politicking and also due to circumstances created by Sanjay Gandhi. 
The prevailing rumor was that Sanjay had intentions of dislodging Gandhi and the trio stood between that. Gandhi's Congress party was crushed soundly in the elections. The public realized the statement and motto of the Janata Party alliance. Indira and Sanjay Gandhi both lost their seats, and Congress was cut down to 153 seats compared with 350 in the previous Lok Sabha, 92 of which were in the South. The Janata Alliance, under the leadership of Mirarji Desai, came into power after the state of emergency was lifted. The alliance parties later merged to form the Janata Party under the guidance of Gandhian leader, Jayaprakash Narayan. The other leaders of the Janata Party were Sharan Singh, Raj Narain, George Fernandez and Adil Bihari Vajpayee. In opposition and return to power Since Gandhi had lost her seat in the election, the defeated Congress Party appointed Yashwantrao Chavan as their parliamentary party leader. Soon afterwards, the Congress party split again with Gandhi floating her own Congress faction. She won a by-election from the Chikmagalar constituency to the Lok Sabha in November 1978. However, the Janata government's home minister, Chowdhury Sharan Singh, ordered the arrest of her and Sanjay Gandhi on several charges, none of which would be easy to prove in an Indian court. The arrest meant that Indira Gandhi was automatically expelled from parliament. These allegations included that she had planned or thought of killing all opposition leaders in jail during the emergency." In response to her arrest, Indira Gandhi's supporters hijacked an Indian Airlines jet and demanded her immediate release. However, this strategy backfired disastrously. Her arrest and long-running trial gained her great sympathy from many people. The Janata coalition was only united by its hatred of Gandhi, or that woman, as some called her. The party included right-wing Hindu nationalists, socialists and former Congress party members. With so little in common, the Mirarji Desai government was bogged down by infighting. In 1979, the government started to unravel over the issue of dual loyalties of some members to Janata and the RSS. The ambitious Union Finance Minister, Sharan Singh, who as the Union Home Minister during the previous year had ordered arrest of Gandhi, took advantage of this and started courting the Congress. After a significant exodus from the party to Sharan Singh's faction, Desai resigned in July 1979. Sharan Singh was appointed Prime Minister, by President Reddy, after Indira and Sanjay Gandhi promised Singh that Congress would support his government from outside on certain conditions. The conditions included dropping all charges against Indira and Sanjay. Since Sharan Singh refused to drop the charges, Congress withdrew its support and President Reddy dissolved Parliament in August 1979. Before the 1980 elections Gandhi approached the then Shahi Imam of Jama Masjid, Syed Abdullah Bukhari and entered into an agreement with him on the basis of ten-point program to secure the support of the Muslim votes. In the elections held in January, Congress returned to power with a landslide majority. <laughs> 1980 elections and third term The Congress under Gandhi swept back to power in January 1980. Elections soon after to legislative assemblies in states ruled by opposition parties brought back Congress ministries to those states. Indira's son, Sanjay Gandhi selected his own loyalists to head the governments in these states. On 23 June, Gandhi's son Sanjay was killed in an air crash while performing an aerobatic maneuver in New Delhi. In 1980, as tribute to her son's dream of launching an indigenously manufactured, Gandhi nationalized Sanjay's debt-ridden company called Maruti Udayag for 4.34 crore rupees and invited joint venture bids from automobile companies around the world. Suzuki of Japan was selected as the partner. The company launched its first Indian manufactured car in 1984. Gandhi, by the time of Sanjay's death, only trusted family members, and therefore persuaded her reluctant son, Rajiv, to enter politics. <laughs> Operation Blue Star In the 1977 elections, a coalition led by the Sikh majority Akali Dal came to power in the northern Indian state of Punjab. In an effort to split the Akali Dal and gain popular support among the Sikhs, Indira Gandhi's Congress helped bring the orthodox religious leader Jarnail Singh Bindranwale to prominence in Punjab politics. 
Later, Bindranwale's organization Damdami Taksal became embroiled in violence with another religious sect called the San Nirankari Mission, and he was accused of instigating the murder of Jagat Narain, the owner of Punjab Kesari newspaper. After being arrested in this matter, Bindranwale disassociated himself from Congress and joined hands with the Akali Dal. In July 1982, he led the campaign for the implementation of the Anandpur Resolution, which demanded greater autonomy for the Sikh majority state. Meanwhile, a small section of the Sikhs, including some of Bindranwale's followers, turned to militancy after being targeted by government officials and police in support of the resolution. In 1982, Bindranwale and approximately 200 armed followers moved into a guest house called the Guru Nanak Niwas, in the precinct of the Golden Temple. By 1983, the temple complex had become a fort for a large number of militants. The statesman later reported that light machine guns and semi automatic rifles were known to have been brought into the compound. On 23 April 1983, the Punjab Police Deputy Inspector General A. S. Atwal was shot dead as he left the temple compound. The following day, after the murder, Harshan Singh Langowal then president of Shiromani Akali Dal confirmed the involvement of Bindranwale in the murder. After several feudal negotiations, Indira Gandhi ordered the Indian Army in June 1984 to enter the Golden Temple in order to remove Bindranwale and his supporters from the complex. The army used heavy artillery, including tanks, in the action code named Operation Blue Star. The operation badly damaged or destroyed parts of the temple complex, including the Akal Takht Shrine and the Sikh Library. It also led to the deaths of a large number of Sikh fighters and innocent pilgrims. The number of casualties remain disputed with estimates ranging from many hundreds to many thousands. Gandhi was accused of using the attack for political ends. Dr. Harjinder Singh Dilgir stated that Indira Gandhi attacked the temple complex to present herself as a great hero in order to win general elections planned towards the end of 1984. There was fierce criticism of the action by Sikhs in India and overseas. There was also incidents of mutiny by Sikh soldiers in the aftermath of the attack. Assassination. The day before her death, the 30th of October 1984, Indira Gandhi visited Orissa where she gave her last speech at the then parade ground in front of the Secretariat of Orissa. In that speech, she strikingly associated her blood with the health of the nation. On the 31st of October 1984, two of Gandhi's bodyguards, Sutwant Singh and Beant Singh, shot her with their service weapons in the garden of the Prime Minister's residence at 1 Safdarjing Road, New Delhi. The shooting occurred as she was walking past a wicket gate guarded by Sutwant and Beant. She was to be interviewed by the British actor Peter Ustinov, who was filming a documentary for Irish television. Beant Singh shot her three times using his side arm and Sutwant Singh fired 30 rounds. Beant Singh and Sutwant Singh dropped their weapons and surrendered. Afterwards, they were taken away by other guards into a closed room where Beant Singh was shot dead. Kahar Singh was later arrested for conspiracy in the attack. Both Sutwant and Kahar were sentenced to death and hanged in Delhi's Tihar jail. Indira Gandhi was brought at 9.30 a.m. to the All India Institutes of Medical Sciences where doctors operated on her. She was declared dead at 2.20 p.m. The post-mortem examination was conducted by a team of doctors headed by Dr. Tirath Das Dagra. Dr. Dagra stated that as many as 30 bullet wounds were sustained by Indira Gandhi, from two sources, a sterling submachine gun and a pistol. The assailants had fired 31 bullets at her, of which 30 had hit, 23 had passed through her body while 7 were trapped inside her. Dr. Dagra extracted bullets to establish the identity of the weapons and to match each weapon with the bullets recovered by ballistic examination. The bullets were matched with respective weapons at CFSL Delhi. Subsequently, Dr. Dagra appeared in the court of Sri Mahesh Chandra as an expert witness PW5, and his testimony lasted several sessions. The cross-examination was conducted by Sri Pran Nath Lekhi, the defense counsel. Salma Sultan gave the first news of the assassination of Indira Gandhi on Doordarshan's evening news on 31 October 1984, more than 10 hours after she was shot. She died two weeks and five days before her 67th birthday. Gandhi was cremated on 3 November near Raj Ghat. The site where she was cremated is today known as Shakti Stahl. Her funeral was televised live on domestic and international stations, including the BBC. 
Following her cremation, millions of Sikhs were displaced and nearly 3,000 were killed in anti-Sikh riots. Rajiv Gandhi on a live TV show said of the carnage, when a big tree falls, the earth shakes. <inaudible> <inaudible> foreign relations Indira Gandhi is remembered for her ability to effectively promote Indian foreign policy measures. South Asia In early 1971, disputed elections in Pakistan led the then East Pakistan to declare independence as Bangladesh. Repression and violence by the Pakistani army led 10 million refugees to cross border into India over the coming months. Finally in December 1971, Gandhi directly intervened in the conflict to liberate Bangladesh. India emerged victorious in the resulting conflict to become the dominant power of South Asia. India had signed a treaty with the Soviet Union promising mutual assistance in the case of war, while Pakistan received active support from the United States during the conflict. U.S. President Richard Nixon disliked Gandhi personally, referring to her as a witch and clever fox in his private communication with Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Nixon later wrote of the war. Gandhi suckered America suckered us less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 this woman suckered us relations with the US became distant as Gandhi developed closer ties with the Soviet Union after the war the latter grew to become India's largest trading partner and its biggest arms supplier for much of Gandhi's premiership India's new hegemonic position is articulated under the Indira doctrine led to attempts to bring the Himalayan states under the Indian sphere of influence. Nepal and Bhutan remained aligned with India, while in 1975, after years of building up support, Gandhi incorporated Sikkim into India, after a referendum in which a majority of Sikkimese voted to join India. This was denounced as a despicable act by China. India maintained close ties with neighbouring Bangladesh formerly East Pakistan following the Liberation War. Prime Minister Sheikh Mujibur Rahman recognized Gandhi's contributions to the independence of Bangladesh. However, Mujibur Rahman's pro-India policies antagonized many in Bangladeshi politics and the military, who feared that Bangladesh had become a client state of India. The assassination of Mujibur Rahman in 1975 led to the establishment of Islamist military regimes that sought to distance the country from India. Gandhi's relationship with the military regimes was strained, due to her alleged support of anti-Islamist leftist guerrilla forces in Bangladesh. Generally, however, there was a rapprochement between Gandhi and the Bangladeshi regimes, although issues such as border disputes and the Faraka Dam remained an irritant in bilateral ties. In 2011, the government of Bangladesh conferred its highest state award posthumously on Gandhi for her outstanding contribution. To the country's independence, Gandhi's approach to dealing with Sri Lanka's ethnic problems was initially accommodating. She enjoyed cordial relations with Prime Minister Sirimavo Bandaranayaka. In 1974, India ceded the tiny islet of Kachathivu to Sri Lanka in order to save Bandaranayaka's socialist government from a political disaster. However, relations soured over Sri Lanka's turn away from socialism under J. R. Jaywardeen, whom Gandhi despised as a Western puppet. India under Gandhi was alleged to have supported LTTE militants in the 1980s to put pressure on Jaywardeen to abide by Indian interests. Nevertheless, Gandhi rejected demands to invade Sri Lanka in the aftermath of Black July 1983, an anti-Tamil pogrom carried out by Sinhalese mobs. Gandhi made a statement emphasizing that she stood for the territorial integrity of Sri Lanka, although she also stated that India cannot remain a silent spectator to any injustice done to the Tamil community." India's relationship with Pakistan remained strained following the Shimla Accord in 1972. Gandhi's authorization of the detonation of a nuclear device at Pokhran in 1974 was viewed by Pakistani leader Zulfikar Ali Bhutto as an attempt to intimidate Pakistan into accepting India's hegemony in the subcontinent. However, in May 1976, Gandhi and Bhutto both agreed to reopen diplomatic establishments and normalize relations. Following the rise to power of General Muhammad Zia-ul-Haq in Pakistan in 1978, India's relations with its neighbor reached a nadir. 
Gandhi accused General Zia of supporting Khalistani militants in Punjab. Military hostilities recommenced in 1984 following Gandhi's authorization of Operation Meghdoot. India was victorious in the resulting Siachen conflict against Pakistan. In order to keep the Soviet Union and the United States out of South Asia, Mrs. Gandhi was instrumental in establishing the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation in 1983. <inaudible> <inaudible> Middle East Gandhi remained a staunch supporter of Palestinians in the Arab-Israeli conflict and was critical of the Middle East diplomacy sponsored by the United States. Israel was viewed as a religious state and thus an analogue to India's arch-rival Pakistan. Indian diplomats also hoped to win Arab support in countering Pakistan in Kashmir. Nevertheless, Gandhi authorised the development of a secret channel of contact and security assistance with Israel in the late 1960s. Her lieutenant, P. V. Narasimha Rao, later became Prime Minister and approved full diplomatic ties with Israel in 1992. India's pro-Arab policy had mixed success. Establishment of close ties with the socialist and secular Ba'athist regimes to some extent neutralized Pakistani propaganda against India. However, the Indo-Pakistani War of 1971 put the Arab and Muslim states of the Middle East in a dilemma as the war was fought by two states both friendly to the Arabs. The progressive Arab regimes in Egypt, Syria, and Algeria chose to remain neutral, while the conservative pro-American Arab monarchies in Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and United Arab Emirates openly supported Pakistan. Egypt's stance was met with dismay by the Indians, who had come to expect close cooperation with the Ba'athist regimes. But, the death of Nasser in 1970 and Sadat's growing friendship with Riyadh, and his mounting differences with Moscow, constrained Egypt to a policy of neutrality. Gandhi's overtures to Muammar Gaddafi were rebuffed. Libya agreed with the Arab monarchies in believing that Gandhi's intervention in East Pakistan was an attack against Islam. The 1971 war temporarily became a stumbling block in growing Indo Iranian ties. Although Iran had earlier characterized the Indo Pakistani War in 1965 as Indian aggression, the Shah had launched an effort at rapprochement with India in 1969 as part of his effort to secure support for a larger Iranian role in the Persian Gulf. Gandhi's tilt towards Moscow and her dismemberment of Pakistan was perceived by the Shah as part of a larger anti-Iran conspiracy involving India, Iraq, and the Soviet Union. Nevertheless, Iran had resisted Pakistani pressure to activate the Baghdad Pact and draw in the Central Treaty Organization into the conflict. Gradually, Indian and Iranian disillusionment with their respective regional allies led to a renewed partnership between the nations. Gandhi was unhappy with the lack of support from India's Arab allies during the war with Pakistan, while the Shah was apprehensive at the growing friendship between Pakistan and Arab states of the Persian Gulf, especially Saudi Arabia, and the growing influence of Islam in Pakistani society. There was an increase in Indian economic and military cooperation with Iran during the 1970s. The 1974 India-Iranian agreement led to Iran supplying nearly 75% of India's crude oil demands. Gandhi appreciated the Shah's disregard of pan-Islamism in diplomacy. Asia-Pacific One of the major developments in Southeast Asia during Gandhi's premiership was the formation of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations in 1967. Relations between ASEAN and India was mutually antagonistic. ASEAN in the Indian perception was linked to the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization and it was therefore, seen as a pro-American organization. On their part, the ASEAN nations were unhappy with Gandhi's sympathy for the Viet Cong and India's strong links with the USSR. Furthermore, they were also apprehensions in the region about Gandhi's future plans, particularly after India played a big role in breaking up Pakistan and facilitating in the emergence of Bangladesh as a sovereign country in 1971. India's entry into the Nuclear Weapons Club in 1974 contributed to tensions in Southeast Asia. Relations only began to improve following Gandhi's endorsement of the ZOPFAN declaration and the disintegration of the CETO alliance in the aftermath of Pakistani and American defeats in the region. 
Nevertheless, Gandhi's close relations with reunified Vietnam and her decision to recognize the Vietnam-installed government of Cambodia in 1980 meant that India and ASEAN were not able to develop a viable partnership. Africa Although independent India was initially viewed as a champion of anti-colonialism, its cordial relationship with the Commonwealth of Nations and liberal views of British colonial policies in East Africa had harmed its image as a staunch supporter of the anti-colonial movements. Indian condemnation of militant struggles in Kenya and Algeria was in sharp contrast to China, who had supported armed struggle to win African independence. After reaching a high diplomatic point in the aftermath of Nehru's role in the Suez Crisis, India's isolation from Africa was complete when only four nations, Ethiopia, Kenya, Nigeria and Libya supported her during the Sino-Indian War in 1962. After Gandhi became Prime Minister, diplomatic and economic relations with the states which had sided with India during the Sino-Indian War were expanded. Gandhi began negotiations with the Kenyan government to establish the Africa-India Development Cooperation. The Indian government also started considering the possibility of bringing Indians settled in Africa within the framework of its policy goals to help recover its declining geostrategic influence. Gandhi declared the people of Indian origin settled in Africa as ambassadors of India. Efforts to rope in the Asian community to join Indian diplomacy, however, came to naught, partly because of the unwillingness of Indians to remain in politically insecure surroundings and partly due to the exodus of African Indians to Britain with the passing of the Commonwealth Immigrants Act in 1968. In Uganda, the African Indian community even suffered persecution and eventually expulsion under the government of Idi Amin. Foreign and domestic policy successes in the 1970s enabled Gandhi to rebuild India's image in the eyes of African states. Victory over Pakistan and India's possession of nuclear weapons showed the degree of India's progress. Furthermore, the conclusion of the Indo-Soviet Treaty in 1971 and threatening gestures by the major Western power, the United States, to send its nuclear armed Task Force 74 into the Bay of Bengal at the height of the East Pakistan crisis had enabled India to regain its anti-imperialist image. Gandhi firmly tied Indian anti-imperialist interests in Africa to those of the Soviet Union. Unlike Nehru, she openly and enthusiastically supported liberation struggles in Africa. At the same time, Chinese influence in Africa had declined owing to its incessant quarrels with the Soviet Union. These developments permanently halted India's decline in Africa and helped re-establish its geostrategic presence. The Commonwealth The Commonwealth is voluntary association of mainly former British colonies. India maintained cordial relations with most of the members during Indira Gandhi's time in power. In the 1980s, Indira Gandhi along with Canadian Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, Zambia's President Kenneth Conda, Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser and Singapore Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew was regarded as one of the pillars of the Commonwealth India under Indira also hosted the 1983 Commonwealth Heads of Government Summit in New Delhi in 1983. Gandhi used to use the Commonwealth meetings as a forum to put pressure on member countries to cut economic, sports, and cultural ties with apartheid South Africa. The non-aligned movement In the early 1980s under Gandhi, India attempted to reassert its prominent role in the non-aligned movement by focusing on the relationship between disarmament and economic development. By appealing to the economic grievances of developing countries, Gandhi and her successors exercised a moderating influence on the non-aligned movement, diverting it from some of the Cold War issues that marred the controversial 1979 Havana meeting where Cuban leader Fidel Castro attempted to steer the movement towards the Soviet Union. Although hosting the 1983 summit at Delhi boosted Indian prestige within the movement, its close relations with the Soviet Union and its pro-Soviet positions on Afghanistan and Cambodia limited its influence. <laughs> Western Europe Indira spent a number of years in Europe during her youth and formed many friendships during her stay there. During her premiership she formed friendship with many socialist leaders such as German Chancellor, Willy Brandt and Austrian Chancellor Bruno Kreisky. 
She also enjoyed closed working relationship with many British leaders including Conservative premiers, Edward Heath and Margaret Thatcher. Soviet Union The relationship between India and the Soviet Union deepened during Gandhi's rule. The main reason was the perceived bias of United States and China, the rivals of USSR, towards Pakistan. The support of USSR with arms supplies and casting a veto at United Nations helped in winning and consolidating the victory over Pakistan in the 1971 Bangladesh Liberation War. Prior to the war Indira signed a treaty of friendship with the USSR. The USSR was not happy with the 1974 nuclear test conducted by India but did not support further action because of the ensuing Cold War with the United States. Indira was not happy with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan but once again calculations involving relations with Pakistan and China kept from criticizing the Soviet Union harshly. USSR became the main arms supplier during the Indira years by offering cheap credit and transactions in rupees rather than in dollars. The easy trade deals also applied to non-military goods. Under Indira by the early 1980s the USSR became the largest trading partner of India. <laughs> United States When Indira came to power in 1966, Lyndon Johnson was the U.S. president. At that time, India was reliant on USA for food aid. Indira resented the U.S. policy of food aid as a tool in forcing India to adopt policies favored by the U.S. She also resolutely refused to sign the NPT Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. Relations with U.S. strained badly under President Richard Nixon and his favoring of Pakistan during the Bangladesh Liberation War. Nixon despised Indira politically and personally. Indira met President Ronald Reagan in 1981 for the first time at the North-South Summit held to discuss global poverty. Indira had been described to him as an ogre but he found her charming and easy to work with and they formed a close working relationship during her premiership in the 1980s. Economic policy Gandhi presided over three five year plans as Prime Minister, two of which succeeded in meeting the targeted growth. There is considerable debate regarding whether Gandhi was a socialist on principle or out of political expediency. Sunanda K. Data Ray described her as, a master of rhetoric. often more posture than policy. While The Times journalist, Peter Hazelhurst, famously quipped that Gandhi's socialism was slightly left of self-interest, critics have focused on the contradictions in the evolution of her stance towards communism, Gandhi being known for her anti-communist stance in the 1950s with Mignad Desai even describing her as the scourge of India's communist party. Yet, she later forged close relations with Indian communists even while using the army to break the Naxalites. In this context, Gandhi was accused of formulating populist policies to suit her political needs, being seemingly against the rich and big business while preserving the status quo in order to manipulate the support of the left at times of political insecurity, such as the late 1960s. Although Gandhi came to be viewed in time as the scourge of the right-wing and reactionary political elements of India, leftist opposition to her policies emerged. As early as 1969, critics had begun accusing her of insincerity and Machiavellianism. The Indian libertarian wrote that, It would be difficult to find a more Machiavellian leftist than Mrs. Indira Gandhi. For here is Machiavelli at its best in the person of a suave, charming, and astute politician. Rosser wrote that, some have even seen the declaration of emergency rule in 1975 as a move to suppress leftist dissent against Gandhi's policy shift to the right. In the 1980s, Gandhi was accused of betraying socialism after the beginning of Operation Forward, an attempt at economic reform. Nevertheless, others were more convinced of Gandhi's sincerity and devotion to socialism. Pankaj Vora noted that even the late Prime Minister's critics would concede that the maximum number of legislations of social significance was brought about during her tenure and that she lives in the hearts of millions of Indians who shared her concern for the poor and weaker sections and who supported her politics. 
In summarizing the biographical works on Gandhi, Blema S. Steinberg concluded she was decidedly non-ideological. Only 7.4% of the total 330 biographical extractions posit ideology as a reason for her policy choices. Steinberg noted Gandhi's association with socialism was superficial, only having a general and traditional commitment to the ideology, by way of her political and family ties. Gandhi personally had a fuzzy concept of socialism. In one of the early interviews she had given as Prime Minister, Gandhi had ruminated, I suppose you could call me a socialist, but you have understand what we mean by that term. Less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 we used the word socialism because it came closest to what we wanted to do here, which is to eradicate poverty. You can call it socialism, but if by using that word we arouse controversy, I don't see why we should use it. I don't believe in words at all. Regardless of the debate over her ideology or lack of thereof, Gandhi remains a left wing icon. She has been described by Hindustan Times columnist, Pankaj Vora as arguably the greatest mass leader of the last century. Her campaign slogan, Garibi Hatao Eng, remove poverty, has become the iconic motto of the Indian National Congress. To the rural and urban poor, untouchables, minorities and women in India, Gandhi was Indira Amma or Mother Indira. Green Revolution and the Fourth Five-Year Plan Gandhi inherited a weak and troubled economy. Fiscal problems associated with the war with Pakistan in 1965, along with a drought-induced food crisis that spawned famines, had plunged India into the sharpest recession since independence. The government responded by taking steps to liberalize the economy, and by agreeing to the devaluation of the currency in return for the restoration of foreign aid. The economy managed to recover in 1966 and ended up growing at 4.1% over 1966-1969. But, much of that growth was offset by the fact that the external aid promised by the United States government and the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development IBRD, meant to ease the short-run costs of adjustment to a liberalized economy, never materialized. American policy makers had complained of continued restrictions imposed on the economy. At the same time, Indo-U.S. relations were straining due to Gandhi's criticism of the American bombing campaign in Vietnam. While it was thought, at the time, and for decades after, that President Johnson's policy of withholding food grain shipments was to coerce Indian support for the war, in fact, it was to offer India rainmaking technology that he wanted to use as a counterweight to China's possession of the atomic bomb. In light of the circumstances, liberalization became politically suspect and was soon abandoned. Grain diplomacy and currency devaluation became matters of intense national pride in India. After the bitter experience with Johnson, Gandhi decided not to request food aid in the future. Moreover, Gandhi's government resolved never again to become so vulnerably dependent on aid, and painstakingly began building up substantial foreign exchange reserves. When food stocks slumped after poor harvests in 1972, the government made it a point to use foreign exchange to buy U.S. wheat commercially rather than seek resumption of food aid. The period of 1967-75 was characterized by socialist ascendancy in India which culminated in 1976 with the official declaration of state socialism. Gandhi not only abandoned the short-lived liberalization program but also aggressively expanded the public sector with new licensing requirements and other restrictions for industry. She began a new course by launching the fourth five-year plan in 1969. The government targeted growth at 5.7% while stating as its goals, "...growth with stability and progressive achievement of self-reliance." The rationale behind the overall plan was Gandhi's 10-point program of 1967. This had been her first economic policy formulation, six months after coming to office. The program emphasized greater state control of the economy with the understanding that government control assured greater welfare than private control. Related to this point were a set of policies which were meant to regulate the private sector. By the end of the 1960s, the reversal of the liberalization process was complete, and India's policies were characterized as protectionist as ever. To deal with India's food problems, Gandhi expanded the emphasis on production of inputs to agriculture that had already been initiated by her father, Jawaharlal Nehru. 
The Green Revolution in India subsequently culminated under her government in the 1970s and transformed the country from a nation heavily reliant on imported grains and prone to famine to being largely able to feed itself, and become successful in achieving its goal of food security. Gandhi had a personal motive in pursuing agricultural self-sufficiency, having found India's dependency on the U.S. for shipments of grains humiliating. The economic period of 1967–75 became significant for its major wave of nationalizations amidst the increased regulation of the private sector. Some of the other objectives of the economic plan for the period was to provide for the minimum needs of the community through a rural works program and the removal of the privy purses of the nobility. Both these, and many other goals of the 1967 program were accomplished by 1974–75. Nevertheless, the success of the overall economic plan was tempered by the fact that annual growth at 3.3–3.4% over 1969–74 fell short of the targeted figure. <laughs> State of emergency and the fifth five-year plan The fifth five-year plan 1974 was enacted in the backdrop of the state of emergency and the 20-point program of 1975. The latter was the economic rationale of the emergency, a political act which has often been justified on economic grounds. In contrast to the reception of Gandhi's earlier economic plan, this one was criticized for being a hastily thrown together wish list. Gandhi promised to reduce poverty by targeting the consumption levels of the poor and enact wide-ranging social and economic reforms. The government additionally targeted an annual growth of 4.4% over the period of the plan. The measures of the emergency regime was able to halt the economic trouble of the early to mid-1970s, which had been marred by harvest failures, fiscal contraction, and the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system of fixed exchange rate, the resulting turbulence in the foreign exchange markets being further accentuated by the oil shock of 1973. The government was even able to exceed the targeted growth figure with an annual growth rate of 5.0 to 5.2% over the five-year period of the plan 1974 to 79. The economy grew at the rate of 9% in 1975-76 alone, and the fifth plan, became the first plan during which the per capita income of the economy grew by over 5%. Operation Forward and the Sixth Five-Year Plan Gandhi inherited a weak economy when she again became Prime Minister in 1980. The preceding year in 1979-80 under the Janata Party government had led to the strongest recession in the history of modern India with inflation rampant at 18.2%. Gandhi proceeded to abrogate the Janata Party government's five-year plan in 1980 and launched the sixth five-year plan 1980 The government targeted an average growth of 5.2% over the period of the plan. Measures to check the inflation were also taken. By the early 1980s, inflation was under control at an annual rate of about 5%. Although Gandhi continued professing socialist beliefs, the sixth five-year plan was markedly different from the years of Garibi Hatao. Populist programs and policies were replaced by pragmatism. There was an emphasis on tightening public expenditures, greater efficiency of the state-owned enterprises SOE, which Gandhi qualified as a sad thing, and in stimulating the private sector through deregulation and liberation of the capital market. The government subsequently launched Operation Forward in 1982, the first cautious attempt at reform. The sixth plan went on to become the most successful of the five-year plans yet, showing an average growth of 5.7% over 1980-85. Inflation and unemployment During Lal Bahadur Shastri's last full year in office 1965, inflation averaged 7.7%, compared to 5.2% at the end of Gandhi's first stint in office 1977. On average, inflation in India had remained below 7% through the 1950s and 1960s. But, it then accelerated sharply in the 1970s, from 5.5% in 1970-71 to over 20% by 1973-74, due to the international oil crisis. 
Gandhi declared inflation the gravest of problems in 1974 at 25.2% and devised a severe anti-inflation program. The government was successful in bringing down inflation during the emergency, achieving negative figures of -1.1% by the end of 1975 76 Gandhi inherited a tattered economy in her second term. Harvest failures and a second oil shock in the late 1970s had again caused inflation to rise. During Sharan Singh's short reign in office in the second half of 1979, inflation averaged 18.2%, compared to 6.5% during Gandhi's last year in office 1984. General economic recovery under Gandhi led to an average inflation at 6.5% from 1981-82 to 1985-86, the lowest since the beginning of India's inflation problems in the 1960s. Unemployment stayed constant at 9% over a 9-year period, 1971 to 80, before declining to 8.3% in 1983. Topic: Domestic policy. Topic. Nationalization Despite the provisions, control and regulations of Reserve Bank of India, most banks in India had continued to be owned and operated by private persons. Businessmen who owned the banks were often accused of channeling the deposits into their own companies, and ignoring the priority sector. Furthermore, there was a great resentment against class banking in India, which had left the poor the majority population unbanked. After becoming Prime Minister, Gandhi expressed the intention of nationalizing the banks in a paper titled, Stray Thoughts on Bank Nationalization, in order to alleviate poverty. The paper received the overwhelming support of the public. In 1969, Gandhi moved to nationalize 14 major commercial banks. After the nationalization of banks, the branches of the public sector banks in India rose to approximate 800% in deposits, and advances took a huge jump by 11,000%. Nationalization also resulted in a significant growth in the geographical coverage of banks. The number of bank branches rose from 8,200 to over 62,000, most of which were opened in the unbanked, rural areas. The nationalization drive not only helped to increase household savings, but it also provided considerable investments in the informal sector, in small and medium-sized enterprises, and in agriculture, and contributed significantly to regional development and to the expansion of India's industrial and agricultural base. Jayaprakash Narayan, who became famous for leading the opposition to Gandhi in the 1970s, was solid in his praise for her bank nationalizations. Having been re elected in 1971 on a nationalization platform, Gandhi proceeded to nationalize the coal, steel, copper, refining, cotton textiles, and insurance industries. Most of these nationalizations were made to protect employment and the interest of the organized labor. The remaining private sector industries were placed under strict regulatory control. During the Indo Pakistani War of 1971, foreign owned private oil companies had refused to supply fuel to the Indian Navy and Indian Air Force. In response, Gandhi nationalized oil companies in 1973. After nationalization the oil majors such as the Indian Oil Corporation IOC, the Hindustan Petroleum Corporation HPCL, and the Bharat Petroleum Corporation BPCL, had to keep a minimum stock level of oil, to be supplied to the military when needed. <laughs> Administration In 1966, Gandhi accepted the demands of the Akalis to reorganize Punjab on linguistic lines. The Hindi-speaking southern half of Punjab became a separate state, Haryana, while the Pahari-speaking hilly areas in the northeast were joined to Himachal Pradesh. In doing so, she had hoped to ward off the growing political conflict between Hindu and Sikh groups in the region. However, a contentious issue that was considered unresolved by the Akalis was the status of Chandigarh, a prosperous city on the Punjab-Haryana border, which Gandhi declared a union territory to be shared as a capital by both the states. Victory over Pakistan in 1971 consolidated Indian power in Kashmir. Gandhi indicated that she would make no major concessions on Kashmir. The most prominent of the Kashmiri separatists, Sheikh Abdullah, had to recognize India's control over Kashmir in light of the new order in South Asia. 
The situation was normalized in the years following the war after Abdullah agreed to an accord with Gandhi, by giving up the demand for a plebiscite in return for a special autonomous status for Kashmir. In 1975, Gandhi declared the state of Jammu and Kashmir as a constituent unit of India. The Kashmir conflict remained largely peaceful if frozen under Gandhi's premiership. In 1972, Gandhi granted statehood to Meghalaya, Manipur, and Tripura, while the Northeast Frontier Agency was declared a union territory and renamed Arunachal Pradesh. The transition to statehood for these territories was successfully overseen by her administration. This was followed by the annexation of Sikkim in 1975. Topic. Social reform The principle of equal pay for equal work for both men and women was enshrined in the Indian constitution under the Gandhi administration. Gandhi questioned the continued existence of a privy purse for former rulers of princely states. She argued the case for abolition based on equal rights for all citizens and the need to reduce the government's revenue deficit. The nobility responded by rallying around the Jana Sangh and other right-wing parties that stood in opposition to Gandhi's attempts to abolish royal privileges. The motion to abolish privy purses, and the official recognition of the titles, was originally brought before the parliament in 1970. It was passed in the Lok Sabha but felt short of the two-thirds majority in the Raja Sabha by a single vote. Gandhi responded by having a presidential proclamation issued, de recognizing the princes. With this withdrawal of recognition, their claims to privy purses were also legally lost. However, the proclamation was struck down by the Supreme Court of India. In 1971, Gandhi again motioned to abolish the privy purse. This time, it was successfully passed as the 26th Amendment to the Constitution of India. Many royals tried to protest the abolition of the privy purse, primarily through campaigns to contest seats in elections. They, however, received a final setback when many of them were defeated by huge margins. Gandhi claimed that only clear vision, iron will and the strictest discipline can remove poverty. She justified the imposition of the state of emergency in 1975 in the name of the socialist mission of the Congress. Armed with the power to rule by decree and without constitutional constraints, Gandhi embarked on a massive redistribution program. The provisions included rapid enforcement of land ceilings, housing for landless laborers, the abolition of bonded labor and a moratorium on the debts of the poor. North India was at the center of the reforms, millions of acres of land were acquired and redistributed. The government was also successful in procuring houses for landless laborers. According to Frankel, three fourths of the targeted four million houses was achieved in 1975 alone. Nevertheless, others have disputed the success of the program and criticized Gandhi for not doing enough to reform land ownership. The political economist, Jyotindra Das Gupta, cryptically questioned. whether or not the real supporters of landholders were in jail or in power? Critics also accused Gandhi of choosing to talk left and act right, referring to her concurrent pro-business decisions and endeavors. Rosser wrote that, Some have even seen the declaration of emergency rule in 1975 as a move to suppress dissent against Gandhi's policy shift to the right. Regardless of the controversy over the nature of the reforms, the long-term effects of the social changes gave rise to prominence of middle-ranking farmers from intermediate and lower castes in North India. The rise of these newly empowered social classes challenged the political establishment of the Hindi belt in the years to come. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Language policy. Under the Constitution of India of 1950, Hindi was to have become the official national language by 1965. This was not acceptable to many non-Hindi speaking states, who wanted the continued use of English in government. In 1967, Gandhi made a constitutional amendment that guaranteed the de facto use of both Hindi and English as official languages. This established the official government policy of bilingualism in India and satisfied the non-Hindi speaking Indian states. Gandhi thus put herself forward as a leader with a pan-Indian vision. Nevertheless, critics alleged that her stance was actually meant to weaken the position of rival Congress leaders from the northern states such as Uttar Pradesh, where there had been strong, sometimes violent, pro-Hindi agitations. Gandhi came out of the language conflicts with the strong support of the South Indian populace.
Topic: <laughs> National Security. In the late 1960s and 1970s, Gandhi had the Indian Army crush militant communist uprisings in the Indian state of West Bengal. The communist insurgency in India was completely suppressed during the state of emergency. Gandhi considered the northeastern regions important because of its strategic situation. In 1966, the Mizo uprising took place against the government of India and overran almost the whole of the Mizoram region. Gandhi ordered the Indian Army to launch massive retaliatory strikes in response. The rebellion was suppressed with the Indian Air Force even carrying out airstrikes in Aizawl. This remains the only instance of India carrying out an airstrike in its own civilian territory. The defeat of Pakistan in 1971 and the secession of East Pakistan as pro-India Bangladesh led to the collapse of the Mizo separatist movement. In 1972, after the less extremist Mizo leaders came to the negotiating table, Gandhi upgraded Mizoram to the status of a union territory. A small-scale insurgency by some militants continued into the late 1970s but was successfully dealt with by the government. The Mizo conflict was definitively resolved during the administration of Gandhi's son Rajiv. Today, Mizoram is considered as one of the most peaceful states in the northeast, responding to the insurgency in Nagaland, Gandhi unleashed a powerful military offensive in the 1970s. Finally, a massive crackdown on the insurgents took place during the state of emergency ordered by Gandhi. The insurgents soon agreed to surrender and signed the Shillong Accord in 1975. While the agreement was considered a victory for the Indian government and ended large-scale conflicts, there has since been spurts of violence by rebel holdouts and ethnic conflict amongst the tribes. Topic. Nuclear program of India Gandhi contributed and further carried out the vision of Jawaharlal Nehru, former Premier of India to develop the program. Gandhi authorized the development of nuclear weapons in 1967, in response to the test No. 6 by People's Republic of China. Gandhi saw this test as Chinese nuclear intimidation, therefore, Gandhi promoted the views of Nehru to establish India's stability and security interests as independent from those of the nuclear superpowers. The program became fully mature in 1974, when Dr. Raja Ramana reported to Gandhi that India had the ability to test its first nuclear weapon. Gandhi gave verbal authorization of this test, and preparations were made in a long-constructed army base, the Indian Army Pokhran Test Range. In 1974, India successfully conducted an underground nuclear test, and officially code-named as Smiling Buddha, near the desert village of Pokhran in Rajasthan. As the world was quiet by this test, a vehement protest came forward from Pakistan. Great ire was raised in Pakistan and its Prime Minister, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, described this test as Indian hegemony to intimidate Pakistan. In response to this Bhutto launched a massive campaign all over the Pakistan to make Pakistan a nuclear power. In these campaigns Bhutto asked the nation to get united and great slogans were raised such as Hum Gaz Aur Pate Kha Le Gay Magar Nuclear Power Ban Krhe Gay We will eat grass or leaves even go hungry but will get nuclear power. Gandhi directed a letter to Bhutto and, later to the world, describing the test for peaceful purposes and India's commitment to develop its program for industrial and scientific use. <laughs> <laughs> Family, personal life and outlook She married Feroz Gandhi at the age of 25, in 1942. Their marriage lasted 18 years, until Feroz died of a heart attack in 1960. They had two sons, Rajiv B. 1944, and Sanjay B. 1946. Her younger son Sanjay had initially been her chosen heir, but after his death in a flying accident in June 1980, Gandhi persuaded her reluctant elder son Rajiv to quit his job as a pilot and enter politics in February 1981. Rajiv took office as Prime Minister following his mother's assassination in 1984, he served until December 1989. Rajiv Gandhi himself was assassinated by a suicide bomber working on behalf of LTTE on 21 May 1991. Gandhi's yoga guru, Durendra Brahmachari, helped her in making certain decisions and also executed certain top-level political tasks on her behalf, especially from 1975 to 1977 when Gandhi 
declared a state of emergency and suspended civil liberties. In January 2017, a woman called Priya Singh Paul claimed to be Indira's granddaughter as Sanjay Gandhi's biological daughter. She claims that she was given away for adoption because Indira Gandhi hid her as a child and her mother as a wife of Sanjay Gandhi for political reasons. Topic: <laughs> Views on women. In 1952 in a letter to her American friend Dorothy Norman, Gandhi wrote, "'I am in no sense a feminist, but I believe in women being able to do everything given the opportunity to develop, capable Indian women have come to the top at once." While this statement appears paradoxical, it reflects Gandhi's complex feelings toward her gender and feminism. Her egalitarian upbringing with her cousins helped contribute to her sense of natural equality. Flying kites, climbing trees, playing marbles with her boy cousins, Indira said she hardly knew the difference between a boy and a girl until the age of 12. Indira Gandhi did not often discuss her gender, but she did involve herself in women's issues before becoming the Prime Minister. Before her election as the Prime Minister, she became active in the organizational wing of the Congress Party, working in part in the Women's Department. In 1956, Gandhi had an active role in setting up the Congress Party's women's section. Unsurprisingly, a lot of her involvement stemmed from her father. As an only child, Gandhi naturally stepped into the political light. And, as a woman, Gandhi naturally helped head the women's section of the Congress Party. She often tried to organize women to involve themselves in politics. Although rhetorically Gandhi may have attempted to separate her political success from her gender, Gandhi did involve herself in women's organizations. The political parties in India paid substantial attention to Gandhi's gender before she became prime minister, hoping to use her for political gain. Even though men surrounded Gandhi during her upbringing, she still had a female role model as a child. Several books on Gandhi mention her interest in Joan of Arc. In her own accounts through her letters she wrote to her friend Dorothy Norman, in 1952 she wrote, At about eight or nine I was taken to France, Jeanne d'Arc became a great heroine of mine. She was one of the first people I read about with enthusiasm. Another historian recounts Indira's comparison of herself to Joan of Arc. Indira developed a fascination for Joan of Arc, telling her aunt, Someday I am going to lead my people to freedom just as Joan of Arc did. Gandhi's linking of herself to Joan of Arc presents a nice model for historians to assess Gandhi. As one writer said, The Indian people were her children, members of her family were the only people capable of leading them. Gandhi had been swept up in the call for Indian independence since she was born in 1917. Thus by 1947 she was already well immersed in politics, and by 1966, when she first assumed the position of Prime Minister, she had held several cabinet positions in her father's office. Gandhi's advocacy for women's rights began with her help in establishing the Congress Party's women's section. In 1956, she wrote in a letter, It is because of this that I am taking a much more active part in politics. I have to do a great deal of touring in order to set up the Congress Party Women's Section, and am on numerous important committees." Gandhi spent a great deal of time throughout the 1950s helping organize women. She wrote to Norman in 1959, irritable that women had organized around the communist cause but had not mobilized for the Indian cause. The women, whom I have been trying to organize for years, had always refused to come into politics. Now they are out in the field. Once appointed president in 1959, she traveled relentlessly, visiting remote parts of the country that had never before received a VIP. She talked to women, asked about child health and welfare, inquired after the crafts of the region. Gandhi's actions throughout her ascent to power clearly reflect a desire to mobilize women. Gandhi did not see the purpose of feminism. Gandhi saw her own success as a woman, and also noted that. Given the opportunity to develop, capable Indian women have come to the top at once. Gandhi felt guilty about her inability to fully devote her time to her children. She noted that her main problem in office was how to balance her political duties with tending to her children, and stressed that motherhood was the most important part of her life. Quote, at another point, she went into more detail. To a woman, motherhood is the highest fulfillment. 
To bring a new being into this world, to see its perfection and to dream of its future greatness is the most moving of all experiences and fills one with wonder and exaltation. Her domestic initiatives did not necessarily reflect favorably on Indian women. Gandhi did not make a special effort to appoint women to cabinet positions. She did not appoint any women to full cabinet rank during her terms in office. Yet despite this, many women saw Gandhi as a symbol for feminism and an image of women's power. Topic awards After leading India to victory against Pakistan in the Bangladesh Liberation War in 1971, Prime Minister Mrs. Indira Gandhi recommended and President V. V. Jiri awarded Mrs. Gandhi India's highest civilian honour, the Bharat Ratna. In 2011, the Bangladesh Freedom Honour Bangladesh Swadhanata Samanona, Bangladesh's highest civilian award, was posthumously conferred on Indira Gandhi for her outstanding contributions to Bangladesh's Liberation War. Legacy Indira Gandhi's main legacy was standing firm in face of American pressure to defeat Pakistan and turn East Pakistan into independent Bangladesh. She was also responsible for India joining the club of countries with nuclear weapons. Despite India being officially part of the non-aligned movement, she gave Indian foreign policy a tilt towards the Soviet bloc. Being at the forefront of Indian politics for decades, Gandhi left a powerful but controversial legacy on Indian politics. The main legacy of her rule was destroying internal party democracy in the Congress party. Her detractors accuse her of weakening state chief ministers and thereby weakening the federal structure, weakening independence of judiciary, and weakening her cabinet by vesting power in her secretariat and her sons. Gandhi is also associated with fostering a culture of nepotism in Indian politics and in India's institutions. She is also almost singularly associated with the period of emergency rule and the dark period in Indian democracy that it entailed. The Congress Party was a broad church. During the independence movement, however, it started turning into a family firm controlled by Indira Gandhi's family during the emergency. This was characterized by servility and sycophancy towards the family which later turned into hereditary succession of Gandhi family members to power. Her actions in storming the Golden Temple alienated Sikhs for a very long time. One of her legacies is supposed to be the systematic corruption of all parts of India's government from the executive to the judiciary due to her sense of insecurity. Although the Maruti Udayag Company was first established by Gandhi's son, Sanjay, it was under Indira that the then nationalized company came to prominence. She remains the only woman ever to occupy the office of the Prime Minister of India. Posthumous honours The two extreme points of India, the northernmost Indira Kal 35.674520 degrees north 76.845245 degrees east and the southernmost Indira Point 6.746780 degrees north 93.84260 degrees east are also named after Indira Gandhi. The Indira Awa Yojana, a central government low-cost housing program for the rural poor, was named after her. The International Airport at New Delhi is named Indira Gandhi International Airport in her honour. The Indira Gandhi National Open University, the largest university in the world, is also named after her. Indian National Congress established the annual Indira Gandhi Award for National Integration in 1985, given in her memory on her death anniversary. The Indira Gandhi Memorial Trust also constituted the annual Indira Gandhi Prize. See also Massa Rangar List of assassinated Indian politicians List of elected and appointed female heads of state and government Category, Indira Gandhi Administration <laughs>